Um, so today, inshallah, we're going to go over some um, points related to Sahih Bukhari, its integrity, its reliability, uh, more specifically, uh, the author of the Sahih. Um, and I'm going to start uh, by mentioning uh, something that happened a few weeks earlier. So I was with one of my dad's friends, and uh, we talked about hadith. And he told me, tell me something. I told him, what do you want me to tell you? He told me, just tell me anything about him. And I told him, well, what I usually tell people is, if you're going to remember one thing, just one sentence, remember this. We can argue for the historical validity of hadith without appealing to faith or divine intervention and without appealing to authority. And what do I mean by that? So, we don't have to, you know, resort to arguments like, well, God promised or Allah promised that he's going to preserve Islam and that entails that hadith is going to be preserved, therefore hadith must be preserved. Or we don't have to appeal to authority and say, well, we trust our Muslim scholars, um, you know, they agreed on this book and therefore we can accept it. Why do I say that? Because we have actual arguments on paper, um, objective arguments as to why we can accept these sources and rely on them, historically speaking. And so this is the fundamental point uh, from today's uh, talk, inshallah. And that's all we're going to do uh, with Sahih Bukhari, inshallah. So, so if you can skip this slide, I don't know if you have time. No, no, go back a little more. Um, one, one slide more? Okay, next slide. Sorry. So just to, so everyone can understand all the points, we're going to have to get some of the basics down. So a hadith um, is a historical report. That's a very general definition. It's a historical report. And these historical reports consist of two main parts. One is called the metin, which is the content of the report. And the other part is called the isnad, which is the chain of transmission from the author to the Prophet ﷺ, usually. But it could be to other you know, people like the Sahaba or the Tabi'in and whatnot. Next slide, yeah. All right, so I got some examples. So uh, this is a famous hadith. Uh, it's Sahih Bukhari and a bunch of other sources. And the metin is, the messenger of Allah وسلم, said, whoever ascribes to me that which I did not say, then let him assume his position in hellfire. Okay? So this is the content of the report. And then we have an isnat, which is Bukhari's chain of transmission to that um, report. We see every single transmitter between him and the Prophet وسلم, And this is one of the few reports where there are only three uh, transmitters between him and the uh, Prophet. So this is a side point. Okay, so Okay, maybe, maybe we can go over this. Um, I don't know if you have enough time, but yeah. So, what do we mean by authentic reports? So we're talking about Sahih al-Bukhari. So this is an exclusively authentic collection. Now, uh, Muslim scholarship has placed several criteria for a report to be deemed authentic. Um, the first one is that the isnad, the chain of transmission, must be connected. We don't want any gaps in transmission. We want to make sure that every single transmitter actually heard the report from the transmitter above him. Otherwise, we cannot accept the report because we don't know, you know the transmitters or transmitter between you know, one transmitter and the other. So that's the first criteria. Um, the second criteria is that every single transmitter in that chain of transmission that's connected uh, must be truthful, and this is what we call adil, and he must be reliable and able to accurately reproduce the reports. So we call transmitters uh, that satisfy this criterion a lava. And so, and then the third criterion, this is a little convoluted, so I'm, uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but essentially, if I could summarize it, is that their transmission must not conflict with the transmission of other reliable transmitters on that same specific account. There are other details, though it's a bit convoluted, and I don't think I have the time to go over, you know, what you do and all that stuff. Next slide, inshallah. Okay, so since we're talking about Sayyid Bukhari, uh, perhaps you can have, uh, you know, uh, a brief biography on who this guy is. So his full name is Muhammad bin Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Mughira ibn Burdizba al-Bukhari al-Jurfi. He was born in 194 after the Hijrah. So around 180 something years after the death of the Prophet He is a third generation Muslim from Bukhara. So his great grandfather al Mughira was the first um, ancestor to convert to Islam. And they were a family of Zoroastrian converts. So they were Majuts originally. Um, at the age of 10, 
uh, Bukhar, Bukhari began attending the uh, hadith gatherings in his uh, native hometown, uh, Bukhara, and he started to develop a reputation. And by the age of 16, he had already memorized the books of Ibn al-Mubarak and Waqiyya. And these are hadith collections authored before Bukhar. And this is an important point I'm going to get to, inshallah, uh, later in this talk. Um, okay, so when he was around 16 years old, he uh, went with his mom and brother to Hajj. Um, and then when it was over, his mom and brother went back and he decided to stay in Mecca and that's when he started to seriously seek hadith and travel around um, in his quest for knowledge. Um, and so he ended up traveling across the Muslim world, um, hearing from different teachers. And so he visited a bunch of different lands. Uh, he went to Medina, uh, Mecca, Balkh, you know, Persia, different cities in Persia, the hubs of hadith like Naysabur, Kufa in South Iraq, Basra, Ashan, he went to Homs and a bunch of different cities. He has a lot of different shields. Which goes to my first point. Uh, pertaining to the reliability of Al-Bukhari. Okay, so the testimony of his contemporaries or superiors. Now, this is not my main argument, but it's a valid indicator uh, we can look at, which is a lot of Bukhari's contemporaries and his seniors or his superiors um, attested to his reliability. And so I mentioned a few names over here. So we have Abu Bakr ibn Abi Shayba saying, we've never seen anyone like him. Or we have Ahmed ibn Hanbal saying, the memorization of Hadith in Khulasan revolves around four people. And he mentioned Bukhari as one of them. Abu Musab al-Zuri said, according to us, Muhammad bin Ismail, who is a Bukhari, has more fiqh and insight than Ahmed bin Hanbal. Okay, Ishaq bin Rahuya. All people of Hadith look at this young man and take Hadith from him. Now, there are a lot of other quotes, but I got these quotes specifically because they're from Bukhari's teachers. Okay, so these are not his students, and to understand the value of these quotes, we have to look at it in their context. So this was before Bukhari became Bukhari, you know, before his Sahih became the you know official book that you know all Muslims have accepted. No, they're talking about a young man who's one of their students. They're all more famous than him. They were all probably more famous than him when they said this. And so, this is yani, a useful uh, testimony we can cite um, when you know arguing for his reliability. They have no reason. Uh, to endorse him. Now there are other endorsements, so you have his students endorsing him, people like Al-Nasai, author of the uh, you know, well-known Sunan, you have a Tirmidhi endorsing him, Bukhari, you have a bunch of other muhadithin that came after him, but I only uh, resorted to mentioning uh, Bukhari's superiors. Next point. Okay, so since we're talking about his teachers, uh, this is a, a really interesting point. So, Bukhari compiled his Sahih, and uh, as we know, he has chains of transmission back to the Prophet now, when we look at the amount of teachers he directly transmits from in his Sahih, we see that there are actually a lot of teachers. It's really impressive. Around 306 different people. So, you know, that's what happens when you travel around all over the world. You end up meeting a lot of different people. And so, he directly transmits from 306 different informants. Now, what does this actually mean? Why is it relevant? Well, these are essentially, if you look at it in the third century context, um, these are 306 independent sources that can potentially falsify Bukhari's transmission from them. So what does that mean? So Bukhari transmits a report through one of his teachers and he ascribes it to him. The teacher can deny transmitting that report. He can deny meeting Bukhari. He can deny even having Bukhari visit their city. Like They can deny the fact that he entered their city in the first place. But we don't see this. And why do I say this? Because we actually have a bunch of examples in the past among the muhaddithin where liars were actually caught this way. So if we can go to the next slide, inshallah. And so we have an example, as Zuhri says, al nuaymi once ascribed the fabricated report to Ibn Muwaffa. Then the people of Hadith identified him, so he fled the city of Baghdad. He remained in exile until Ibn al Muwaffa died. So it wasn't easy to, to ascribe reports to reliable transmitters, let alone major transmitters who had tens of other students. It was really easy to identify people. And there's another example I have in mind, um, which Abdal Al-Qutni mentions in his, uh, in his Su'alat of Al-Hakim to Abdal Al-Qutni, where another transmitter, he ascribed 20 reports, just 20 reports, um, to one teacher, and they caught him, and the teacher was actually looking for him. Like, they were not easy going when it came to Hadith. And it was really easy to identify liars, and so when you have a guy transmitting from 306 people, over 7,000 reports, and no one condemned him for that, and his teachers are actually praising him, this is actually a good indicator that this person probably was not walking around making stuff up and describing it to his teachers. 
Okay, I just wanted to show it. I'll show it one of the times. Okay, this is one of the most important arguments, which is the corroboration. So, this is a fact. Almost every single hadith that is found in Sahih al Bukhari can be found corroborated in, in, in independent sources. Okay? So, there is almost nothing Bukhari exclusively transmits in his Sahih. And so, to prove this point, I performed an analysis of Kitab al Ilm from Sahih al Bukhari, which is a sub book, a um, representative sample, around 75 reports. And I actually found that every single report is found in an independent source. So the point is, if we were to delete Bukhari from history and delete his Sahih, we would not actually lose anything. You know, that's like, that means a lot. Okay. Next point, inshallah. Okay, so this is just the diagram, right? This is what a corroboration looks like. So the star over here is just Bukhari's individual chain of transmission to this uh, specific report. And these are a bunch of different corroborations, and you can see it branching out to a bunch of different authors who independently reported the same hadith. You have Muslim, Ahmed Hanbal, Ibn Hibban, uh, Ibn Majah, and others. So it's really interesting. Okay, this is the fourth point, which is Bukhari's earlier sources. So as I mentioned earlier, um, by the age of 16, Bukhari had memorized the books of Ibn Mubarak and the books of Waqiyya, right? Is it Waqiyya? Okay, so when he was authoring his Sahih, he actually relied on earlier sources. He wasn't just walking around, you know, blindly memorizing everything and just throwing it out there. No, they actually had books. He was relying on those books. Now, why is that relevant? Well, in Sahih al-Bukhari, we find him transmitting reports through these authors. Okay? These authors that already authored books. And so an example is like Malik, author of the Muwatta. We have Al-Humaydi, author of the Muslim. The Musannaf of Abdul Razak Sanal, the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. These are all collections that were authored before Bukhari um, that Bukhari relied on when he was authoring his Sahih. Now, how is that relevant to Bukhari's reliability? Well, we find Bukhari transmitting reports through these authors, transmitting reports through these authors. So, if we find that the majority of these reports are actually found in their books, then we can know, okay, Bukhari wasn't making these reports up, right? And if we can find Bukhari accurately reproducing these reports, just as they're in the books, then again, we can also see that Bukhari is um, a very reliable transmitter when it comes to reproducing reports. So, next slide, inshallah. And so again, I performed this statistic. Um, same book, Kitab al It was just easy and already you know, went through it. Um, 75 reports. Okay. So I found that Bukhari quotes Imam Malik six times. Okay, so Malik, author of the Muwatta, Bukhari transmits reports to him six times. Um, he quotes Al Humaydi once, who also authored you know, another book, as we said. And he quotes Ali ibn al Jad, who was another um, early primary source author. Okay, so this is, in total, we have eight references from early extant sources. Now, we have Bukhari quoting other authors, but unfortunately, we don't have their books today, so we can't really um, evaluate that. But we look at what we have, right? He's quoting these people. Now, do we find these reports in their books as he quoted them? Or is he making these up? We'll see. Next slide. Okay, so after going through them, five out of the six of the reports, Bukhari ascribed to Malik, are actually in Malik's Mokba, and they are coded verbatim. Same thing for the report of Muslim al Hamidi, it is in Muslim al Hamidi. And same thing for the report Bukhari ascribes to Ali ibn al Jah. It actually is in Muslim Ali ibn al Jah. And so we find it that Bukhari. Um, first of all, again, he obviously did not make these reports up. We can you know, throw that out the window. The second point is that he was able to accurately reproduce and transmit these reports, just as the authors um, intended. And you know, if anyone's interested, I can actually um, send you the reports because I have all this information, the raw data, all with me. Uh, next slide, inshallah. Okay, so this is a really nice point. So this is Bukhari's meticulousness uh, when transmitting from his teachers. So what does this mean? So throughout the Sahih, you'll find Bukhari, um, he has certain teachers where he directly transmits from them. So he'll say, I heard this from so-and-so, okay? And then on other instances, you'll find him transmitting from those same teachers with intermediaries, with a person between him and his own teacher. So what does that tell us? Well, it tells us several things. Uh, one, 
uh, Bukhari was able to distinguish reports he had directly heard from his teacher and reports he had indirectly heard from him. And so what does that tell you? He's not just a guy randomly collecting reports and just blurting them out and not accurately retaining them. No, he has a detailed um, you know, recollection of these reports, what he heard and what he didn't hear. Because it's easier for him to just say, you know, I heard it from my teacher and just move on like that. But the fact that he occasionally adds intermediaries between him and his teacher tells you a lot. It tells you that he actually cared and he actually um, was really keen on noting when he actually heard something and when he did it. And so, um, Ibn Hajar, I found this in Fath al-Bari and other uh, sources. Bukhari actually does this with a bunch of his teachers. So, you have Mu'awiyah ibn Abd al-Azdi, Sa'id bin Nasr, Abdullah bin Nidhi bin Muqarib, Ubaidullah bin Musa. He does this. You'll find him occasionally transmitting from them directly. And you'll say, Haddathana Ubaidullah bin Musa. And then on another occasion, you have him transmitting through Ubaidullah bin Musa with an intermediary. And here's an example I found in uh, Kitab al-Tahajjud. I was going through that as well. And so, you have, so I underlined that Ubaidullah bin Musa, who is his teacher, here he transmits um, hadith to him with an intermediary who is his half, I think it's his half in Muslim. And we have another um, hadith directly transmits from Ubaidullah bin Musa. So it tells you a lot. He was very careful that he even noted you know, what he directly and what he indirectly heard um, from his um, teachers and informants. Okay, this is also a really, really nice point. Um, so it really revolves around the concept that liars have a motive. Liars want their lies to be believed. You know, no one's going to make up a lie and then disprove it, at least in the third century. So we have Bukhari transmitting a hadith and then criticizing them, and then pointing out potential flaws in these, in these hadith. Um, and so I found some examples. Um, we have a Bukhari saying, Abu Nuhayim told us from, from Ibn Uyina. So this is Isnab. Abu Nuhayim told us from Ibn Uyina, from, from Jabir ibn Zayd, from Ibn Abbas, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said such and such. Okay. After transmitting the report, Bukhari comments saying, Ibn Uyina later used to instead transmit this report from Ibn Abbas from Maimuna. But the correct rendition is that of Abu Nuaim. So he's telling you, the main transmitter in that Sanat, Ibn Uyina, after this report was documented from him, changed, changed his mind. And he started transmitting the Sanat with, a different, with, a, with an additional transmitter uh, between Ibn Abbas and the Prophet Now, if he were a liar, there's no point in him mentioning this, right? Um, rather, a liar would want this report to be circulated. Um, there's no point in showing, you know, any potential controversy um, in the report. So it could just, there's no reason for him. It's not in his interest if he's trying to circulate forged reports. But rather, we find him actually explicitly pointing out um, to potential flaws in these reports, you know? So points that may actually give rise to skepticism. I have another good example where uh, Bukhari transmits a report, again, it's in a bunch of other sources, um, where the Prophet is quoted saying, Oh Allah, destroy Quraysh, it's part of a larger hadith. Oh Allah, destroy Quraysh, oh Allah, destroy Quraysh, oh Allah, destroy Quraysh, to Abu Jahl, Uthman bin Rabi'a, a bunch of other people, and Ubay bin Khalaf. Okay, so this is the wording of Al Bukhari. After transmitting the report, Bukhari comments saying, Yusuf bin Ishaq transmitted it from Abu Ishaq that his name was Umayyah bin Khalaf. Shu'ba said it is either Ubay or Umayyah. So Shu'ba wasn't sure. And then Bukhari says, the correct rendition is Umayyah. So Bukhari is admitting that his actual report, the report he transmitted, has a mistake in it. He didn't change it. He didn't tamper with it. He didn't ignore this. He was really keen on accurately reproducing the report as it is, even though it could have been wrong uh, on certain uh, Aspects. And so we see this, you know, you have a whole name that was wrong, and he left it as it is, and after transmitting it, he said, you know, this is a mistake. If he was a liar, he could just fix it without, you know, telling anyone. He can leave it, leave it as it is without even coding uh, Yusuf bin Ishaq, you know, correcting the report and whatnot. Okay, so, so the conclusion, inshallah, is really fast. Faster than I expected. Um, so Bukhari's reliability and integrity can be attested through six main points. Number one, the testimony of his superiors and his contemporaries. Number two, the vast amount of teachers who did not falsify the content he ascribed to them. Number three, the independent corroboration of almost every single report he transmits in his Sahih. Point number four, Bukhari's truthful and accurate transmission of reports from earlier sources. Point number five, 
his meticulousness when transmitting reports from his teachers. And point number six, his criticism of his own reports. And I think with these points, and there are a bunch of other arguments, I should have mentioned them, I thought we were gonna have enough time. Um, SubhanAllah, I was told that we may not have enough time. But nonetheless, um, these points, along with a bunch of other arguments we have, um, you know, suggest that we can make a really strong cumulative case uh, for the reliability of uh, Al-Bukhari. And we can show that this guy was not a liar, he was not a weak transmitter, he was a really accurate, and reliable, and truthful transmitter of hadith who, you know, compiled the Sahih Ahmad al-Sahih Bukhari. So, this is the end. Can you help us understand how someone's testimony can be such a big deal to us? Because it's just one person saying something about someone else, right? So, as Muslims, why do we hold that to high reverence? Is that this is a really good question. And it really is one of the fundamental points in uh, hadith sciences when we're evaluating transmitters. So, when a muhaddith, you know, endorses a transmitter, what does that actually mean? Well, what it actually means is that he's evaluated some of his reports and he's seen that he's a reliable transmitter. Now, how, do, how do you identify weak transmitters? This is probably a good question to ask yeah. in this context. We identify weak transmitters or liars, and it's really easy to identify them, by two main indicators. One, regular exclusive transmission. And two, conf regular conflicting transmission. So if you have a transmitter who regularly transmits exclusive reports, no one else transmits. This is a huge red flag. If you have a transmitter who regularly transmits conflicting reports with other transmitters, this is also a red flag, right? If it goes against what other transmitters are saying, this is probably an indicator that he didn't accurately retain the report. And so when a muhaddith says, so-and-so is a thiqa, it means that he's negated these qualities from Thiqa means reliable. He's a reliable transmitter. Um, you essentially have negated um, you know, this, uh, these points pertaining to that transmitter. He does not have a lot of exclusive reports that are, that are usually called manakir. He doesn't have conflicting transmission. And so that's the value. And this is the thing. We can actually verify all these endorsements. So it's not like we're just blindly following the endorsements of the muhaddithin. We can actually go to every single transmitter they endorsed. And we can show objectively on the paper by evaluating their reports, why they're reliable and why they're not. And I'm actually working on a paper um, regarding a liar. And I'm going through his reports and I can see it's pretty clear that he's a liar. Got a question? Yeah. So, more or less, like, when you talk to somebody who doesn't believe in hadith, because I've actually met um, other Muslims who say that things in hadith are inaccurate, regardless of who's quoting what or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, is this kind of like the breakdown that you give them when you explain the validity of hadith and things like that? Or is there, like, a specific uh, approach that you take to something like that? Well, I mean, here's the thing. Um, so this, this talk was specific to Bukhari. Now, the people who reject hadith often have a variety of reasons, right? They're not like one monolith. So it really depends on, on the person you're talking to. I've encountered like a lot of different arguments, you know, ranging from I don't like, you know, how it sounds, to um, I don't trust the, the way it's transmitted. And, you know, you're going to address each argument differently. So it really depends. I mean, if you can specify the... the so the, the biggest points. argument that I found was that why would we trust, basically, the word of someone from 300, 400 years ago right. over a specific uh, thing that we have to do? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, th here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. I encourage that people, you know, ask, you know, why should I trust Sayyid Bukhari? And the question is, you don't have to trust him. Why? Because everything that's in his book is also another source. Everything in that other source is also in another book. If we were to kill Bukhari, you know, when he was back then in the third century, not the best choice of words, but um, we really would not lose anything. We'd have every single hadith that is in his Sahih. You don't have to trust anyone. You see that diagram, if you can go back to the diagram. Um, Idea. Okay, so like if we were to delete Bukhari, we really did lose nothing in any of this. You see, the, the common link is Abu Huraira, the companion of the Prophet. So even if you were to, to you know, question Malik's transmission or Abu Zina's transmission, you still have independent uh, corroborations. And even when it's exclusive, we can show why it's, it's authentic and not a problem. So it really depends on the argument presented, but I think yeah, we, can, we can make a really good case. No question. Yeah, there's not for us. So then, um, what is, this is an honest question, what, what is the true uh, real import of Bukhari if all the material is in other sources? This is a good question, and I hope that, I was hoping someone would ask it. Um, so Bukhari did 
what Bukhari did essentially was he compiled all these authentic reports. So these reports that are authentic, that can be found in other sources, are dispersed. Right? The Alim al Musnad Ahmad, you can find them in your Jamia at Tirmidhi, Sunan Abi Dawood, Sunan Abi Naja, the different books, Sariq Baghdad, you'll find them in a bunch of, of sources dispersed. Bukhari you know, did all the work, all the scrutiny, compiled all these authentic reports, which is a really, really hard job. And um, he ordered them. Like, again, that's another really valuable thing. He arranged them according to the uh, headings. Um, so they're usually um, pertaining to fiqh. So he arranged the reports, you know, lumped them up together. And he essentially you know, filtered out these reports from all these different sources. So it's a really valuable work. So if we didn't have Sahih Bukhari, we'd have all these reports. It'd just be a hassle to collect all these authentic reports in one place. And would they have been unauthenticated in all the other sources? Well, it depends on the source we're talking about. So some of them are, we have other Sahihs other than Bukhari, sure. um, a bunch of other ones. But um, the way authentication works, it's really independent of the book. We, we evaluate the chain of transmission. And we can actually, like, regardless of whatever the author said, we can actually look at the report and conclude whether it's authentic or not. Does that answer your question? I think. Good. You had a question? It's yeah. Interesting. So this is just a quick one on this picture I wanted to ask. Um, so who is that Ismail? Is that his father? Or is Ismail? Like you see, oh, no, that's, that's, not, not, that's not his father. Okay, okay. That's, that's, his father died when he was young, correct? Right? His father also uh, seeked hadith, and uh, Bukhari said that his father actually transmitted from Sufyan, if I'm not mistaken. He was the first one in his family to seek hadith, his father. This is Ismail bin Abi Wais. Okay. And Bukhari often transmits uh, in Sahih. He was a relative of Malik, so that's another beneficial point to know. I also have another question. Can you go sure. to the slide? I think it's the next slide. It's like where number four is. So next slide after this. After this. So the one. So this. Um, so the first one right there. Yeah. The, so is this is this claiming that he word for word quotes that? Yeah. And okay. So you can find it. The one six would be the hadith that's not that's not verbatim, correct? What was that? So you see the one sixth of yeah. the article, it's not in Malik. That's the one that's not verbatim, but it's quoted. Oh uh, no, that hadith is not in Muwatta, but it's independently transmitted back to Malik through other sources. Oh, it's not in Muwatta. It's not in Muwatta. Muwatta was still Muwatta is a smaller book. Okay. So, I mean, it's not a surprise to find one report not being mentioned there. But, you know, the vast majority are actually found in Muwatta, word for word. And if anyone's interested, I actually have the reports with me on an Excel spreadsheet. So, if you want, I can give them to you and show you. Exactly as are with the same snout as well. Oh. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Right sure. Um, one, it's are you able to email back? Uh, very quickly. Are you able yeah. to email that? Yeah, definitely. I can email you. Yeah, you can give me your email and I'll email okay. it to you. Sure. Um, the second thing, can you go back to the graph? Yeah, the graph. So, what's the response, I guess, then to? You have a star by al Bukhari, and obviously the topic is about al Bukhari. Mm -hmm. But isn't this whole analysis dependent on the premise that Ismail and Malik, uh, Malik, like all the way up leading to Abu Harid, like, aren't they perhaps, don't you have to automatically defer to them? To It's kind of a circular argument, isn't it? That Abu Harid, Harid if he were not credible, mm -hmm. then referencing oh, yeah. him as an equally corroborative source doesn't really do you any good, right? I mean, I'm asking it really yeah, not I'm, I'm thinking about it. I mean, if we're going to use that reasoning, go. Um, okay, so if we look at, so if it was just Bukhari transmitting uh, this report and no one else, then people would probably have more reasons to doubt the report, right? If we see Bukhari is saying, ascribing something to Matt, and we see five other people ascribe the same thing to Matt. I think, you know, logically speaking, it, it, you have a really high possibility that you know, it is actually accurately ascribed to Malik. We know that Malik was a muhaddith, you know, he was a proliferant, uh, you know, transmitter of hadith. And so it's not a surprise that, you know, a bunch of students from that era are going to ascribe reports to him. And the fact that it's corroborated, um, you know, means a lot. Bukhari didn't make this up. At least we can prove that, right? So it's clearly not fabricated by Bukhari. Now, I think the Bukhari, I mean, that's a whole different uh, issue, and, and you know, it is a topic you have to address, you know, the reliability of the Sahaba, for example. We can address it, and I have a problem. We can set up another talk and go over, you know, the companions of the Prophet and their reliability or not. Um, but I, I think, you know, just looking at this, we can tell, okay, clearly Bukhari is not a problem in this, in this diagram. It's, if it is a lie, which I'm open, you know, to considering that, it's clearly not Bukhari's problem. It's something higher somewhere in this 
Now, you can go over that, inshallah, but uh, I think you know that's at least a lot. Oh, and then question number three. Sure. Uh, I've, I've seen somebody do this, I don't remember the specifics, but is there a way to describe the corroboration and like kind of parallel credibility to like justices or, or judges in the current day, an opinion or consensus on opinions? Is that applicable here at all? Uh, to be honest, I don't know how the judicial system works over here. Have you been teaching Fukaha or Jurassic? Is that what you meant? Yeah, I mean, no, I just. So these are um, essentially just. I actually don't know. I, don't, I can't get I mean, the knowledge. The law, the credibility of the source yeah. is just measurement of accuracy. How well, yeah. So, as I, I said earlier, when you asked me about the reliability of transmitters, there actually is a way to objectively measure the reliability. And so, that, that's why we have a distinction between a fiqa and a saduq. So, you have transmitters that are, that are described as fiqat, they're like reliable. But not only, are they, not only are they trustworthy, but they're reliable. They can accurately produce their reports. And we have Saduq. We have someone who's truthful, but he's not necessarily uh, the most reliable. And how do we do that? You know, there actually is a way. We can draw a distinction. We evaluate the reports. We like, just lay them out. This process is called Sabah. And you actually find it you know, being done in some of the books, like Ibn Hadiz and Kanat al Ba'fa al Rijal. He does this. He'll mention the biography of the transmitter. He'll quote you know, the different opinions or the endorsements or the criticism this transmitter has uh, had. And he'll actually list some of his reports, and he'll go through, and he'll say, you know, oh, this, he exclusively transmits. No one corroborates this report, so this is a problem. And we do that, so when a transmitter, you know, regularly has problematic reports, he exclusively transmits, or reports that conflict with other reliable transmitters, or other transmitters, the majority, um, when this, you know, is a recurring theme, he's not as reliable anymore. He goes up. And so, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty nice process. So, I mean, we can verify that, and again, we can have a talk on that. And I'm writing a paper um, on this topic where there was a liar, or someone suspected of being a liar and a forger in the second century, by all, a, a bunch of them, and I'm going through his reports, and I'm saying, well, there actually is you know, a plausible um, you know, reason, or there's a good reason to think he was a liar. And you look at his reports, regular exclusive reports, regular conflicting transmission, and we can you know, show this on paper. So maybe we can do that in the future. What's your question, Marshall? My hand was up first. Your hand was up first. <laughs> for uh, could you uh, delve a bit into uh, disinterested reports, as well as uh, themes that would be expected had yeah. a transmitter been working? Okay, so this is nice. This, these are some of the arguments I was going to actually include, and then I excluded, because I thought we weren't going to have enough time. Um, so disinterested accounts. This is a really, really valuable point, which is, um, we're talking in the second century, third century. You had you had different theological groups. You had motives to forge reports that would you know support people's own theology. And you had you had the happening, right? It happened. People who were from a certain school would fabricate reports in, in the virtue of their school or supporting the theology of their school. Okay. So when we have forgers, as we said, there's a motive to forge reports, and this is one of the main motives uh, from that time. So we look at Sahih al Bukhari. We realize that it, it consists primarily of what we call disinterested accounts. These are accounts that no one has an interest in forging, right? It's a, a report on wudu. Like, why would Bukhari forge a report on wudu? It's like, there's no political interest, there's no theological interest. No one's, or, or for example, the reports on, you know, the Prophet said, let me say Bismillah before eating. Like, it's not theologically motivated. It's not politically motivated. And so these are called disinterested accounts. And when we have, you know, you know, a book that primarily consists of disinterested accounts, this is another indicator that that book is probably sound. And the Sahih Bukhari is like that, right? Most of the reports, almost all the reports are not really charged theologically. They're not like biased. They're not political reports. They're all disinterested accounts. And so this is a really important point. What was your second uh, question? Uh, about the themes that would be expected had a certain transmitter been a portrait. This is another point I was planning to include, but uh, I didn't. Uh, so we actually have, believe it or not, we actually have books um, of hadith that are actually all forged, like from the start. Like a liar came, a liar came, made a book, added Asani to it, and you know, circulated the book. We actually have books. So we have like books like Musnad Zayd. So if you have, you know, like any Yemenis in the room, they would maybe know that it's one of the main sources that are utilized by the Zaydiyya. This book was exclusively authored by a liar known as Amr ibn Khalid al-Wasqi. Now, in this book, we see a theme. 
Um, he transmits most of the reports, if not all of them, with one chain of transmission. Right? It's uniform. Is a liar came and he just you know like got one chain of transmission and started adding you know reports to it. We have other forged books, same thing. Um, so we have a book called Al-Ashafiyyat, authored by Muhammad Muhammad al Ashad, who, who was another liar who was caught lying. Same thing. One is now throughout the whole book. So this guy took a bunch of reports, got one chain of transmission, and just you know attached it to them. And um, this argument is not my argument. This argument is actually used by Matsky, Dr. Harold Matsky, who's not a Muslim. And he was arguing for the reliability of Abdul Razak al Sanani, who's one of our reliable muhadithi. And he made this point. He saw that there's variation across his book. There's no uniform transmission. And so this is indicative that this variation is merely representative of natural transmission. He's not a liar. And if you were a liar, you'd expect uniformity throughout the book. And the same argument can be made for Bukhari, right? There's, there's not just like one snag, one thing. It's just, he's, he's clearly not a liar. So, when we talk about Sahih and we talk about Hadith books, there's many books, right? Like Sahih, Muslim, and Tirmidhi, and all that. And even like in Sahih itself, there's many Sahih books that most people don't talk about. So, why is it that Bukhari is like number one mentioned? Why not like Sahih, Muslim, and the other books? What makes his books? Special? You know, actually, um, so Bukhari has actually been, you know, the number one book. Yeah among Sunni scholarship you know, for at least 1,100 years. But you know, the scholars of Al-Maghrib, you know, North African scholarship, has actually preferred Sahih Muslim due to certain reasons, and, and the arrangement of the book and whatnot. I mean, this is all, I mean, to be honest, it's, I consider it um, arbitrary, really. Um, it's just more of a social construct, the canon. But in reality, it's, it's a source, it's a primary source, useful primary source. Author did a really good job. And therefore, you know, people liked it and started relying on the book. That's all. But it's just like any other source. Jamia Timothy, you know, you look at reports, you have some reports with more authentic asanid in these different books. You might find the hadith and Sahih Bukhari with a snad, and a Timothy may have a more reliable snad to that report. So this is more of a social construct. The, con the concept of a canon is only emerged in the 5th century, 6th century. Um, Ibn Tahir al Makhdis, if I'm not mistaken, was the first to say the five books. The five books as a construct, and then it became the six books. But it's not really that big of a deal. Um, we also have a question. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that uh, themes that forgers have when they compile these reports, but is there a specific topic that these forgers like to portray? Like, what do they what do they forge? Is it like reports to benefit them, or it really depends on the forger. So you have different motives. You have theological motives. So you have a transmitter from a different school. You even had Sunni you know, forgers, people who would come and forge reports that supported the Sunni theology. And the Muhaddithin, who were primarily Sunni, actually rejected it and they identified it. But it will depend. You have some forgers forging reports about the virtues of their hometowns. Right? You have that. You know, have a hadith in the Fala'id of the city of Qazwin, the Prophet Sallam praising some random city in Persia, like no one knows about back then. Um, and so it really depends on the forger and the motive, but these are interested account, regardless. Regardless of the topic, they're interested. There's a reason someone would want to forge this. I know there was a question. Can you go over the note cards? Yeah, I was going to go over them, like, you know, it's just a mess. Um, okay, so it's kind of out of topic, but um, see how the Quran came down like, in the scriptures? Um, like, how did it become a book? Like, who? This is the uh, Pandora's box. But nevertheless, um, the Quran, so actually was primarily transmitted as a moral, uh, so like a primary source. And Uthman uh, al um, actually compiled the codex, you know, the book, but it was for a while transmitted orally. So it wasn't really widespread as a book until, you know, much later, maybe a few centuries after Uthman's death. Um, and that's after people, you know, started writing, learning how to write. You know, earlier, not all Sahaba used to know how to write. Um, and so eventually people started to rely less on memory and more on writing. And we see this in hadith too, by the way. So at a certain point in, in history, everyone started using books and, you know, usul, he's calling usul. And, and I think it's, it's similar for the Quran. I'm not that experienced with the transmission of the Quran, but I think it's generally in the Quran. Does that answer your question? Um, <coughs> any other questions from that side? Okay, I got it. Um, are there notebooks written? 
are there any notebooks or written records of Bukharis that scholars can see now? Really good question. Unfortunately, we don't. These are called the Usul. And we have the Sahih, right, which is one of his, his books. But we don't have Bukhari's Usul, as in, so each Muhaddith used to have a document called the Asl, where he would go to his Sheikh, write all the reports he heard from him, and then from that, they would offer their books. You know, they'd use that as like their notes. Uh, we don't have that. We lost all of the Usul of the Muhaddith. These are really personal documents. These are not public. Sahih was a public document. It was a public primary source. These are much more private. But we have attestations to some of them in the books of it. You'll find someone coding. I looked at his asal, I saw that. But we don't actually have the documents with us today. Allah Ta'ala. Let's go to the next question. Can you share in detail uh, the time span where Al Bukhari was. Lined. Lined. <laughs> okay. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I haven't researched that, so I wouldn't be able to answer it. Let's go to the last one. Uh, what is the authenticity of the story about Bukhari being tested? Really good question. About Bukhari being tested by the people of Iraq by switching up the Asani, the popular hadith. Okay, so I'll go to the first question. Uh, this report actually is baseless. Um, and Uqaydi quotes it in Abu Akhtar al Kabir uh, with no sound. He says, Our Sheikh told us. We don't know who told him who said what. And it's probably an embellished story. Um, we don't really have any. any authentic uh, the of the story, where Bukhari sat down and they started switching up the, the chains of transmission and the reports, and Bukhari was able to identify each one. It's a very embellished story. Um, and unfortunately, you know, this is, this is a sentiment I have. It's unfortunate that stuff like this is what gets popular about Bukhari, right? We have a lot of objective arguments from his book. Like, we can argue, independent, you know, they're not nice, but this is the stuff that gets popular, unfortunately, right? All these nice stories, or like, if anyone's heard of this, they say like, Bukhari once went to a guy, Bukhari once went to a guy to transmit hadith from him, and then that guy had like a horse or something, and the guy tricked his horse. Did anyone hear that story? Okay, one person heard it. Good, I heard it. <laughs> okay. Um, Bukhari tricked, so the guy tricked his animal and lied to it and, and made it seem as though he had food, and the animal came, and then he tied it up. And so Bukhari ditched the guy. Oh, and he yeah, didn't transmit it from him. It's like, it's baseless. Like, this is not even in any of the books. So instead of like using actual arguments, historical, <laughs> objective historical arguments, we like have these sensational stories that are like baseless. So uh, yeah. Okay, there's a second question. How do we as a community protect fellow Muslims from falling or the shubhat raised by people trying to, to legitimize Sayyid al-Bukhari, the Sharif Jabir video recently? Good, good question. Oh um, it really depends on, on the people and the type of arguments they're susceptible to. Um, some people, you know will not doubt hadith for a reason, but they'll doubt it for another reason. Um, the advice I give to people is, listen, if you're not an expert, don't, exp don't expose yourself to arguments you want to go to address, right? I don't go in debating quantum mechanics. I just don't know anything about it. I'm not going to delve into the discourse, you know? Same thing. If you're not competent in it, then don't, like, sit down. Allah in the Quran tells us, you know, If you see people, you know, messing around with our verses or disrespecting them, then don't sit with them until they change the topic. So, if you're, you know, hearing doubts and you're not competent in the field, then don't debate it. Don't like delve into it. Refer it to an expert and they can explain it to you and why not. Now, if someone's already, you know, fell into the trap, then, you know, there's, we can talk, we can, it's gonna, you're gonna have to teach the person and sometimes it may not work. Um, the Sharif Jabir video recently, uh, I know someone who wrote a really good response to it. If you're interested, I can send it to you. Um, I have the link with me. Um, it's a really bad argument, by the way. Sharif Jabir is a mess. I'm not even going to get to that. I mean, it's just emotional nonsense. Um, okay, sorry, you have a lot of okay. more you. If we want to get like, started in like, learning more about Hadith, yeah. or like, getting into this kind of stuff, what books would you recommend, or videos, or like, what would you recommend we start on? You're talking about English sources, right? I guess. Okay, um, how about this? I'll refer you to my friend, Abdullah Matez. He's sitting in the audience. Um, he's more aware of the English sources. I don't know Arabic sources, but it's like primarily very good. We don't have like any like maybe. I mean, there are a bunch of good, good articles, good papers I'd refer you to, some good books. And if you want, I can talk to you about that. I mean, do you have like one or two you can mention like right now? Or, like... I mean, I wrote several articles um, that, are, that are not bad. And the reason I'm referring you to my articles is just because there's not a lot of content in English. Okay. Um, so I have an article. I can send the links out. I mean, okay. It may be hard for people to track it down. I'll, I'll send them. Maybe you can send them to, to what's on the table. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, how do you recommend, I guess, we like, approach studying Bukhari? Like, 
You know what I mean? Like to, to extract as much as we possibly can. So, hmm, this is an interesting question. Um, so the thing is, that these blocks are really, if you want to extract the most benefit, you're going to have to be an expert in Hadith, and an expert in Hadith, really. There are certain things that are hidden that you would only notice if you like, got, understood Hadith. You say, oh, Bukhari is indicating something. Or he's, it's like a hidden gem you find somewhere. Um, these books are not, we're not authored for public consumption. You know, it's the reality of the matter. Um, obviously, we don't have a problem people reading Hadith and benefiting from that. But um, it's not where people start. There's usually a lot more people go through before they can get to Bukhari. It's like usually at the top. Uh, let me just go through this so I don't forget it. Okay, that was pretty random. It's probably not the question. Oh, that's that's the button. Okay, sure. Uh, very interesting. Zakallah Khairan, can you put it on? Oh, I got it. Sure. I'll leave it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, so we're getting out of topic over here. So, Tilka is in my field. Tilka is not my field, um, but this is one of the things I actually know of you know, I don't know a lot. But, uh, something essentially, the Yusulim define halam as something where you're always punished if you perform and rewarded if you avoid. And then makruh is something where you're not punished if you do it, but you're rewarded if you avoid it. Is that cool? Wallahi, that comes down to, to, to the fiqh and the madhab you follow. There's a way they, they derive that from the hadith. Yeah, I'm not really an expert on this, so that's probably the limit of my knowledge from the topic. Allah Allah. How authentic is the story about Shufari throwing his sack of meat? Mm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, no, to be honest, and I don't think it's probably not authentic. I'm just saying. You, know, you have all these nice stories like. Who, who recorded this? You know, who saw Bukhari do this and then like wrote it down? Did Bukhari write it down? Like, I went to the scene, I like, threw a sack. Yeah, all these stories are really questionable. Um, if you're gonna have something authentic, it's gonna be more realistic. You know, they're normal people walking around and you know, writing heavy these in circles and whatnot. They weren't like you know superheroes. So, I hope that. That's it. Let's go. Kind of final question. Hey, so why do you put time into authenticating? Hadith, if they've all already been authenticated, you know, because I think you explained to me that you do that, right? You go yeah, through it. That's your practice. I like, okay, I don't know the design of that. And, and have yeah. you um, also have you discovered versus? I think it would be interesting to to see uh, hadith that were rejected by the Qadi, but they almost made it, mm -hmm. and ones that were accepted by him. But they almost got rejected because okay. they were like right there on the tipping point. That would be interesting. Go ahead. Um, first question. Well, uh, why why do we authenticate the hadith? Why do we evaluate the hadith? Well, the thing is, this is just a small work in the general body of the hadith. This is just seven thousand. We have tens of thousands of reports that have not necessarily been thoroughly analyzed. Wow. Um, we have you know tens of different sources that you know need scrutiny. And there's nothing wrong with you know even analyzing reports inside of hadith. You know, why should I trust Bukhari? He said it's Sahih. Let me go through okay. it. I can see that it's authentic. You do that? Yeah. I can do that. You do, do you go through and like re authenticate Bukhari's? I can tell you, yeah, this report yeah. actually is authentic. And some reports, like a tiny, tiny minority, we're talking like 0 0.1, 0 0.00 something percent. Uh, some scholars declared some reports in Sahih Bukhari to be weak. Like Sheikh Al Ban, weak in some reports. And I think he was right. You know, if you look at the chain yeah. transmission, they're actually weak. You know, we're not like blindly just swallowing this whole book. Yeah, but they're not radically weak, just a little weak, right? No, some of them are like, obviously there's something seriously wrong, for sure. Like 100%, this did not happen. They probably did not say this. We have certain instances like that. So like the famous one. What was that? So those sneak in. It's not sneak in. Well, you have to admit it, he made a mistake. Okay. Like he made a mistake with a detail. He flipped the detail by accident. He accidentally transmitted something from a weak transmitter, but he replaced him with another reliable transmitter. Because he used to make mistakes, mistakes in the chain of, chains of transmission as well. So there's, there's a lot of different factors that can come into play, and we can identify them, and that's what's nice. So we can actually identify the weak reports in Sahih Bukhari, which are a you know, really tiny number on the reports. Your second question was about reports that are in the middle. This is a, a, an interesting um, topic that I have not really researched a lot, because you can't really tell 
often you can't really tell whether Bukhari rejected it. Just because it's not in the Sahih, it doesn't necessarily mean that he rejected it. Maybe he just never got to it, right? Well, I mean, there could be a variety of reasons why he, he wouldn't include a report, and that can come you know, down to jurisprudence. It can come down to him having, you know, uh, a more sufficient report on the topic. But, like, things. would there be a volume of um, hadith rejected by Bukhari? Yeah, so we have, like, books like al uh, al-Kabir by Tirmidhi, who's one of his students. He, like, mostly is coding Bukhari, asking him about ahadith, and Bukhari would tell him, no, this report is weak, this is its problem. And, and so throughout the book, it's essentially Bukhari grading reports and telling him you know, what's the mistake in these reports. Mm -hmm. So we do have that, yeah. And we do have, you know, other hadith encoding Bukhari in the different books of Su'alat, you'll find some things. So, yeah. Any other questions? Sister? What's your opinion about the ones that came out from the It's an us. I mean, what can we say? You have, you know, now theology is getting essentially over, overridden by politicians, you know. They're like telling you Sayyid Bukhari has uh, weird sounding reports and it's an us. I mean, that's not how it works. Um, I mean, there's nothing to say really. It's just what's happening is absolute haram and it's a blur and all the scholars should, you know, should object to that. Who are you as a politician to tell me what to do with, you know, our historical sources? It's like just Trump now. It's like, so if you can imagine what's happening, it's like Trump delegating someone uh, to like tamper with Sahih Bukhari and change it around and filter it. Like, who are you to, who are you to like mess around with our primary sources? It's a mess. I mean, what can we say? It's just the situation of the Any other questions? Yeah. Can you talk about the Sahih Bukhari and like the Sahih Bukhari?